I think we can still say good morning, right? How is everyone doing? Good? OK. We are incredibly thrilled, Kim and I, to share 20 minutes with you on a topic of the application of AI on human lives, on patient experiences, and customer personalization. So I would just get straight to the point here. And healthcare, as you all know, is a incredibly complex and a highly regulated industry. Uh, however, in recent times, the goalpost of care has shifted significantly. And uh, it's becoming increasingly outcome focused, more personalized, more connected. And the patient that actually sits in the middle of the healthcare ecosystem, uh, it, they are significantly more empowered today than even five years back. They're asking, and rightly so, better healthcare experience. They are expressing their willingness to participate in designing their own care. Uh, our company, ZS, conducted a recently uh, voice of customer study, and 53% of the US adult population revealed that they would like to actively participate in the design of their care in partnership with the healthcare systems. 72% of US adult populations are saying that they would like healthcare systems to shift away from disease management to prevention and wellness. So these are new trends, and they're creating new demands for newer types of innovations, better economics, speed, and scale. The good news, however, is most healthcare leaders are embracing that change. They're embracing digital innovations, they are definitely wanting to leverage AI to fuel those digital innovations. In fact, healthcare has the highest AI investment across all industries, according to Stanford AI Index, $29 billion in the last four years. The second largest was FinTech at $25 billion. This industry is also data rich. 30% of the global data that's produced is actually contributed by healthcare. So overall, the scope and the opportunity of AI in healthcare is tremendous and significant. However, like I said, it's a highly regulated and complex environment. So success of AI in healthcare is going to look a little different. And I think there are three success factors that we should watch for. One is the data landscape. Our digital lives are producing an enormous amount of new and novel types of data. Dietary patterns, exercise patterns, socioeconomic status, environmental conditions. And it turns out that some of these factors have more than 80% importance on healthcare outcomes. So if, if we think about how the industry is shifting, we can always think about today that we can create a digital twin of ourselves. And that will, be con that will consist of attributes such as biological, physical, and socioeconomic attributes. And that can all feed into AI models. But abundance of data alone is not going to win the day for AI in healthcare. We don't think that's, that's going to be the case. Uh, we need better data exchange standards, better data interoperability, data sharing rules, and APIs. Uh, in the US, the FHIR actually has created better data standards for sharing uh, EHR data across healthcare stakeholders and ecosystems, uh, much like what the airlines industry did many, many years back. Uh, in Europe, the project Melody was an attempt to create a consortium where 10 pharmaceutical companies actually shared data uh, so that drug discovery could be accelerated. And blockchain and uh, federated learning techniques were used so that data could be shared, but the commercial secrets were safeguarded. So the success here is data to some extent, 
but the infrastructure for data sharing, exchanges, standards, that holds a very high premium. The second factor here is the stakes of collaboration between AI and human is significantly higher, in my opinion, in healthcare. Uh, life sciences companies, med device companies, pharmaceutical companies, employs a very large sales teams. 50 to 70 percent of the marketing budget actually goes into this face-to-face -face sales channel. And yes, AI-based recommender systems provide customer insights and suggestions and um, to navigate the overall healthcare ecosystem, but the human judgment that is required by the sales rep to navigate this complex ecosystem is quite, quite large. So if I compare that with the auto insurance industry and algorithms can predict uh, the, the membership churn and come up with next best offer recommendations and really automate the pull through of that to campaign management systems or call center, we can do those things in healthcare. Uh, if algorithms are predicting that a patient is not going to be adherent or going to switch therapies, the field needs to be activated. The field will have very little information about the patient, if anything at all. They will need to engage the clinician and the clinician has job becomes to encourage the patient to remain on therapy. So the human judgment factor is quite large for AI to be successful in healthcare. The third factor I would just say is, is AI able to create impact on human lives and on the society at large? And uh, if we pick out Apple as a company and think about Apple's healthcare offerings over a period of time. Three years back when Apple iWatch came, um, the offerings were mostly wellness focused. There's an app for ECG monitoring or there's an app for sleep disorder detection. Two years later, the ECG monitoring app also was able to diagnose FIB. And more recently, Apple is allowing iPhone data integration with EHR systems, so it's going from wellness to diagnosis to disease management because that data integration will allow better longitudinal view of the patient's journey. Now if we think about extrapolating that to a broader healthcare device ecosystem, as of last year, the FDA approved 130 software as medical device, SAMDs, AI-powered medical device. But it turns out only two of them were approved by CMS, Center of Medicare and Medicaid, for reimbursement purposes. And the adoption of AI-powered devices in healthcare, that's the success barometer, is, is dependent on whether Medicare and Medicaid is supporting that. And for these institutions to support that, not only those products need to be highly efficacious and uh, be consistent, but also it needs to foster trust in patient lives as well as transparency. Transparency in algorithms, transparency in how the algorithms are trained. So overall, there is a the third factor that AI has to impact patient lives for it to be successful in healthcare. But not just that, it also has to do that in a very trustworthy and transparent way. So speaking on patient lives, I'm gonna to turn to Kim. Um, she's the head of rare disease in UCB, and she has a range of real world experience and talking about AI in UCB from patient experience to personalization. Kim? Thanks, Avi. So over the next few minutes, I'll take you on a couple journeys through different use cases. Um, our approach at UCB is first and foremost to understand the patient. So if you look here, you see a fairly stereotypical patient journey where you have symptoms, you're diagnosed, you get treatment, and then you continue. It's anything but simple, especially for those living with rare diseases. What I see is I see Veronica. I see Alexis. I see Jeremiah. I met Veronica in 2009 
as a patient in one of our clinical trials. She had went undiagnosed with epilepsy for years. After diagnosis, it took her another decade to get her seizures under control. You can think about the lost days, the lost moments. Veronica's education was delayed. It took her years to finally get her seizures under control and go to college. I see Alexis. I met Alexis several months back. Alexis is living with a rare disease, myasthenia gravis, MG. It's a neuromuscular disease. Alexis's diagnostic journey was actually pretty clear. He had a drooping eyelid, had some blurred vision from an ophthalmologist, went straight to a neurologist. They did a battery of tests, and he was diagnosed very quickly. However, however, in the last 24 years, he doesn't know when his symptoms are going to happen. He doesn't know when he's going to have muscle weakness, when he can't play with his kids. When I look at these journeys, I also see Jeremiah. So Jeremiah is a rare disease patient. Jeremiah is one of 300 people living in the US with a rare mitochondrial disease thymidine kinase 2, which is a DNA depletion syndrome. The only way he stays alive is by being in a clinical trial, taking medicine three times a day to keep him and his disease from progressing. So how do you take all of these insights, that depth, that granularity about patients and turn it into use cases? How do we take our insights to create actions to create impact. One of our learnings at UCB has been as we've started to release some of these use cases, for example, thinking about next best action, where you're having to train sales reps to rely and accept recommendations from data. This is not something that happens overnight. It requires a significant investment in change management. And it's not just change management like, I'm going to send an email, you're getting a new version of something. It's truly understanding the change that you want these individuals, that your end users, to take so that they can create impact. And the second learning that we had was measurement. You can create the most beautiful use cases, have the best data, AI, and ML, but it won't go anywhere unless you measure your effect to make sure it's successful. So taking all of the learnings to go from insight, action, to impact, I'm going to share two use cases with you. The first is about hyper-personalization. So COVID threw the pharma industry into hyperdrive. You heard from Savi how much we invest as an industry into AI and ML. It's a ton, everything from target identification, to clinical trials and patient finding, to enhancing the effectiveness of your commercial model. What we learned is our content wasn't sticky. We needed to get better. We had to learn from other industries, like many of you represent here. What we employed was really first the insights, understand from A-B testing and other sources, what's sticking with physicians? Was it the font size? Was it the tonality? Was it the type of content? And taking that to be able to create a taxonomy and essentially micro-tag a lot of our content and then create segments based on what is resonating. However, this doesn't happen overnight. A lot of the pharma industry was focused on channels and channel optimization, so we've had to change. But what we've done is been able to measure the impact of these actions, much higher click-through rates, much higher open rates. So we're starting to see the trans uh, transition from channel optimization to true hyper-personalization, looking at some of these micro-affinity characteristics. One of the most important use cases in leading an organization in rare disease is patient finding. I think about Alexis, myasthenia gravis, not knowing when he's going to fluctuate or not, 
hour by hour differences, environmental triggers that may make it a good day or a bad day. I think about Jeremiah with TK2D, one of 300 patients with this disease. We can decrease the time to diagnosis, we can decrease the time to optimal treatment and have better outcomes. One of the areas that it takes to be successful is first understanding that patient journey. All of those gaps, and you heard that this morning in a number of the talks, where patients get stuck. Either their symptoms don't translate to a diagnosis, or they're prescribed a medicine and they become a never start patient, or they get stuck. They get stuck in an infinity loop where perhaps they're more like Veronica who would have a seizure, go to the ER, get loaded up, discharged, be fine for a bit, and then repeat that cycle on a monthly basis. So we are able to take the data, understand throughout the journey how we can have some of these signatures to do things like lookalike analyses, understand where we may predict the next patient that is having a gap in care, the next patient that is just waiting for their diagnosis. So we're utilizing patient finding to truly affect the outcomes of patients, but also our efficiency within the healthcare system. And from a corporate objective, we get more efficient. If you look at trying to cover the US to find one of those 300 patients, we need to have an AI-enabled field force to be able to drive those outcomes. And lastly, when I think about all of the learnings that Sabi has shared, and then the use cases that we've begun to perfect, it's all about the patients. How we can take the data, AI, and our people to drive outcomes for people living with severe diseases. So thank you.